How you doing everybody? Welcome back to Stay and Focus for Jesus. As you see, this video is titled Time Travel, Teleportation, and the Mystery of the Seven Golden Candlesticks. The Pre-Trib Rapture Exposed. Now I've done many videos on this topic in regards to what we call the rapture and from me studying the scriptures and what the Lord has shown me there are multiple raptures in the end times. There are multiple raptures, what we call raptures or catching aways that happen during the end times period. So you may not know that time travel, it is real, um, but it's not real in the way that they portray it in the movies. There's certain things they can and cannot do. I'm going to touch on that a little bit. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. That's really for a completely separate video. But also teleportation, it is real. And it's also in the scriptures. Um, in regards to time travel, we are really, all of us are really time travelers. All of us are really time travelers. The book of Ecclesiastes uh, speaks about that. It's a small verse that um, speaks about the past, present, and future. And it talks about um, time and time travel and stuff like that. And it correlates with some other scriptures. Lord willing, I will make it to that video and be able to do it one day. But in this case, we are addressing the pre-trib, what's known as the pre-trib um, rapture the pre-tribulation catching away and we're going to expose it and see from a biblical perspective is it real or is it false is it even possible and again I've done many videos on this people will argue and say that it was a uh, um, what's that guy name um, John Darby that made it up we're going to use strictly the scriptures Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. <clears throat> Excuse me. Rightly dividing the word of truth. So we want to rightly divide the word of truth. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. So when somebody says that nobody's perfect, none of us are perfect, they're lying because the Bible tells us to be perfect. When the Bible is telling us, when the book of salvation is telling us to be perfect, it is talking about our love being perfect, which brings forth perfect fruit of the spirit. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world. What we consider the, uh, the gods that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. So the wisdom of God that we speak in a mystery, um, in the hidden wisdom, God ordained this for our glory. God ordained this for us. So the reason that many people don't understand this, the reason that there's a lot of confusion about it, is because God is the one who's giving the revealing of not only this mystery, but uh, other mysteries in the scriptures. <clears throat> and our brethren could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but, at, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. And this is what I'm seeing. Many um, Christians are still carnal, or they're acting carnal, and um, they're not able to bear the different things that are being put out. So Paul says, I couldn't speak to you spiritually, I had to speak to you carnally. A lot of my videos, I have to speak carnally in a way that people can understand carnally. Because when I just speak it straight up spiritually, then it goes over the head. 
to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. So remember I told you that even the, um, what we call the fallen angels, <clears throat> they are watching true believers and seeing what's going on and they are taking the manifold wisdom of God that is being revealed to us and they are twisting it. They are twisting it and causing confusion. So the mysteries of God, they are revealed to us. The whole world is watching. All the angels, they're watching. Again, might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God. So what did John mean that he was in the spirit? What did John mean that he was in the spirit? I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Notice that he was exiled because he held to the word of God, what we call scriptures and for the testimony of Jesus Christ, the gospel. So we know that John would have been a believer, a born again, Bible believing believer. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. So it says he was in the spirit. And he heard a voice behind him, a great voice. Then it says, after this, I looked and behold, a door was open in heaven. And the first voice, which I heard as was as it were of a trumpet talking with me. So this is later, this is Revelation 4, which said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. I will show. So he was going to see these things. And immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. So we see that being in the spirit in regards to what we're talking about it has something to do with being taken from one place to another. So he was ta he was literally taken into the future time travel. Then we have Revelation 17, 3 and Revelation 21, 10. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast for names of blasphemy, having seven heads and 10 horns. So what happened? He was carried there in the spirit. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. He was carried there. So are there any other examples of this in the scriptures besides John of being taken from one place to another? And when even was now come, his disciples went down unto the sea and entered into a ship and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was now dark and Jesus was not come to them. And the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew. So when they had rowed about five and 20 and 30 fur furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh unto the ship and they were afraid. So this wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't too big of a ship. But he saith unto them, it is I, be not afraid. Then they willingly received him into the ship. My sheep hear my voice. My sheep follow my voice. He spoke to them and they knew it was him. And what happened after that? And immediately the ship was at the land where they went. The day following, when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there were that there was none other boat there, save the one where into his disciples were entered, and that Jesus went not with his disciples into the boat, 
but that his disciples were gone away alone. So there was this great, it was a storm. That's why the people that were there, they only, um, the people that were on the other side of the sea, they saw no other boat. So either the other boats were destroyed by the storm or they didn't make it to the, uh, what's called, they were still out there on the water. But the boat that Jesus was in, that he got in after he was walking on the water, um, it, it immediately was at the land. And behold, I send the promise of my father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass while he blessed them, he was departed from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. See, we have Jesus being carried up into heaven, being taken from one place to another. And we also see that what? And they worshiped him. So the people that say that, oh, Jesus wasn't worshiped, they're lying. <laughs> Many examples of Jesus being worshiped in the scriptures. Why didn't Jesus rebuke him if he wasn't, if Jesus was not God manifested in the flesh, then why didn't he rebuke him? I mean that Jesus committed sin. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses, witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. So it's giving us more detail when he was, when he was, uh, uh, caught up when he was taken up, he was taken up in a cloud. I believe that this cloud was a, uh, what we consider a, a hurricane or a tornado. I think it was more so a, like a, a hurricane, but it wasn't like a violent one. And they came to pass as they still went on and talked that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up, same thing. He went up by what? By a whirlwind into heaven, whirlwind, a hurricane or a tornado. You know, when you look it up, it says a storm or a tempest, a hurricane. And Elisha saw it and he cried, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. He took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. So when Elijah was taken up, um, all his clothes, they, they didn't go with them. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, they departed hither and thither and Elisha went over. And when the sons of the prophets, which were to view at Jericho saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. And they said unto him, behold now, there be with thy servants fifty strong men. Let them go, we pray thee, and seek thy master. Lest peradventure the Spirit of the Lord have taken him up and cast him upon some mountain or into some valley. So even in the Old Testament, the Old Testament prophets, they understood these things, but for some reason, we have a hard time understanding these things. They understood that the Lord, the spirit of the Lord could take somebody up and put them wherever he want to put them at. So, um, the sons of the prophets, they came to Elisha and he was telling them the story, telling them everything that happened. And then they said, Hey, 
Let's go look. Pretty much, let's go look for him. Let's. I know what you're saying, but hey, let's go make sure that the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord, didn't take him up and cast him upon some mountain or into some valley. So they didn't even believe what he was saying because he's going to get on them a little bit, as you're going to see. And he said, "Ye shall not sin." And when they urged him till he was ashamed. He said, sin. So he said, just go do it. Get out of my face. You, you're getting on my nerves. They sent therefore 50 men and they sought three days, but found him not. And when they came again to him, for he tarried at Jericho, he said unto them, did I not say unto you, go not? So they came back to him and they said, hey, we didn't find him. He said, you're not going to find him because he was caught up. The Lord, the spirit of the Lord uh, took him up. So time travel, teleportation, um, you know, which one ever you want to use. More so um, what we call time travel. Just from him being here on earth and then being caught up into uh, the third heaven with God who is outside of time. Going through a wormhole, through a, a, a whirlwind. So here's Ezekiel and he says, so the spirit lifted me up and took me away. And I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit. So it was, it happened so fast. It was so intense, but the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. So you can just imagine what he was going through. Look at the context. And I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit, but the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. Why would the hand of the Lord need to be strong upon him? Cause he was, he was afraid it was happening so fast. Then I came to them of the captivity at Tel Abib that dwelt by the river, river of Shebar. And I sat where they sat and remained there astonished among them seven days. So the spirit lifted him up and took him away from where he was at all the way to a different place took him to them that were of the captivity at Tel Abib. And he sat there with them. He was, and he remained there astonished. He was astonished at what had just happened. That he was teleported from one place to another place. He, in essence, he time traveled. Ezekiel again. Then I beheld and lo a likeness as the appearance of fire <clears throat> from the appearance of his loins, even downward fire and from his loins, even upward as the appearance of brightness as the color of amber. And he put forth the form of a hand and took me by a lock of mine head and the spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem to the door of the inner gate that looketh toward the north, where was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provoketh to jealousy. So God let him see into the future. He took him up and he let him see into the future. He took, the spirit lifted him up between the earth and the heaven. And he saw, he got, he came to these visions. He, he was literally seeing this. He was literally there. It wasn't just like a vision, you know what I'm saying? You, you go into a trance or whatever, you see stuff. And even with that, as you're going to see, if you go into a vision, let's say you're sitting still, you can be sitting still and the Lord can take you out, your, out, out of your body, your spirit, and then you can go into the future. Um, I've had that happen not a lot of times, maybe like two or three at the most, um, you know, out of the body or in the body, you know, I don't know. I, I believe... I was out the body because it was, it was, it was, it was too real. It was just too real. And some of you have had experiences like that. Um, so when these events do happen, a lot of times they are real and you come back, you're like, did that really just happen? Did I, did I really go there? Did I really go there? Moreover, 
This is Ezekiel again. Moreover, the Spirit lifted me up and brought me unto the east gate of the Lord's house, which looketh eastward, and behold, at the door of the gate five and twenty men, among whom I saw Jazaniah, the son of Azur, and Pelatiah, the son of Benaiah, princes of the people. Then said he unto me, Son of man, these are the men that devise mischief and give wicked counsel in this city. So he, he took them to the east gate of Lord's house and he showed them he showed them these people that were that were doing uh that were doing uh these wicked things. Time travel. Afterwards the Spirit took me up and brought me in a vision by the Spirit of God into Chaldea to them of the captivity. So the vision that I had seen went up from me. Then I spake unto them of the captivity all the things that the Lord had showed me. So again, the Spirit took him and brought him in a vision by the Spirit into Chaldea to them of the captivity. And then guess what? He spoke to them. He spoke to the play. He spoke to the people that were in this captivity. What the Lord has showed him. So, again, when it's talking about a vision, it's not just talking about, um, you know, again, you're sitting down and then you have a vision, or you know, then you sleep, and you have a vision. A vision can also be you being, uh, um. You being transported from one place to another. And then you literally stay in there. Or it could be you go there in spirit and then boom. You come out of that that uh that vision. And then you try to get yourself together and you know comprehend what just happened. And try to figure out did you really just go here? Um the the occult, they do it, but they do it the witchcraft and the way they do it, what is called is astral project projection, projection, astral, A S T R A L. If I'm not mistaken, projection. Um, it's said that, uh, Jay Z does that. I'm pretty sure there are many others that do it. The government has something that they called a uh, project looking glass where they were able to allegedly look into the future, but they could only go to a certain point. They could only see certain things. Then ultimately once they re re they reach a certain point, they couldn't see anymore. Now, how true that is, is in regards to, uh, you know, once they reach a certain point, they couldn't see anymore. You know, I, I don't know. And I even heard that with this machine, when they were peering into, um the future that um different things were coming through different things were coming through so there's a lot that's going on that you know is it's it's real deep we may think it's sci-fi but a lot of stuff they put in these sci-fi movies i've come to a realization that it's true because i grew up on sci-fi movies like literally I used to have the marathons on Saturday, have all the good sci-fi movies. Me and my mom used to watch them all day. And now I'm looking back. I thought about it. I even talked to my mom about it one day a few years ago. I said, you know that uh, a lot of the stuff that we used to, we used to watch on sci-fi back in like the, um, the 90s and stuff. That, it, you know, it's, it's coming to pass. It's true. She's like, yeah. They say truth is stranger than fiction, and that is true. In the five and twentieth year of our captivity, in the beginning of the year, in the tenth day of the month, in the fourteenth year after that, the city was smitten. In the selfsame day, the hand of the Lord was upon me and brought me thither. In the visions of God brought he me into the land of Israel and set me upon a very high mountain. So see, he's having a vision, but he's literally there. The Lord was showing him something. So just because it says vision is not talking, it's not always talking about like going into a trance. I was talking about that. 
by which was as the frame of a city on the south. And he brought me thither. And behold, there was a man whose appearance was like the appearance of brass with a line of flax in his hand and a measuring reed. And he stood in the gate and the man said unto me, Son of man, behold, with thine eyes and hear with thine ears. So he's telling them to, hey, see what you are seeing and hear what you are hearing and set thine heart upon all that I shall show thee. So he says, receive. This is real. He's saying, hey, open your heart up to receive this because this is real. Pay attention. That's what he's telling them. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. Before he uh, came to die, die as the, uh, the, the lamb. For to the intent that I might show them unto thee art thou brought hither. Declare all that thou seest to the house of Israel. So he was, he went and saw the stuff, uh, literally, and then he went back and he prophesied and told the, uh, the, uh, house of Israel, what he had seen. So this is where Paul, he asked his, um, his experience, his event. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. I had the same thing happen to me like two or three times. Um, you know, I don't know if I was in the body or out of the body. Uh, I, I think I, <laughs> I was gone. But, you know, just from that standpoint, it's like, did this really just happen? You know, your flesh is like, did I, did I leave? Did my whole body leave or was it just my spirit? Because a lot of times when you go through that, you know, it, it's, it's so spiritual. You know, you, you feel, you feel, you feel your spirit and you don't know if it's your whole body or not. Because the one time I did have it happen that I, that I can remember off the top of my head. Um, when I was coming back down, well, what happened was, uh, I prayed about something and I really, really wanted to know and the Lord, you know, he showed to me, I was laying, I was laying on my bed and then, um, next thing I know, it just felt like I, I, I was starting to be lifted up and I was going through the, um, the, the stars and the galaxies. And then it just started to speed up, just started to just speed up super duper fast. You know, it's, it's kind of like in the movies where you see the like going through a wormhole, but it wasn't all these different colors. It was just, I can just tell I was moving extremely, extremely fast. And then it just like, whew, it just stopped and I just came to this point or whatnot. And, um, that's when I seen the Lord sitting on, sitting on his throne. I didn't see his face. So, you know, I didn't see his face. Um, he was, he was just so bright. It was just so bright. And, um, what stood out to me was if I hear some noise in the background, that's, uh, that's rain <laughs> just started pouring out raining real hard. But, um, what stood out to me was that he had a, a, I didn't know what it was at the time. It was a sepulcher in his hand. He had a sepulcher in his hand. And the reason that it stood out so much was because it wasn't bright like everything else. And God did it like that purposely. It wasn't bright like everything else. And so I stayed there, you know, so I don't know how long it was. We're going to just say a few minutes or whatnot. And then I felt myself just floating back down, floating back down, floating back down. And, you know, literally to me, it felt like my body was also being laid back down on, um, on, um, uh, on my pillow. Now it could have just been my spirit. I don't, I don't know. I'm just telling you what happened. And then the day after that, I was studying some other stuff. And then I was reading the book of revelation and that very scripture came up in regards to um, Christ ruling with the rod of iron. And when I read it, it was like ding, 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 ding. <laughs> and my mouth just dropped open because then I, I knew what had happened was, was real. Cause I couldn't, I remember when I was going through that, that, um, I, again, the, the rod, the sepulcher or whatnot, it kept on standing out to me. I was like, why is everything so bright? But that is not bright. 
and God did it like that purposely because he led me to the scriptures. And when I saw that, saw that scripture, I knew what I had prayed for. It, it was true. So some of you may have had experience like that. Maybe not exactly like that, but, uh, you know, maybe you have, maybe you haven't, but I'm just, I'm just bearing witness to also what Paul went through. Now, I didn't go through the same experience as Paul up to the third heaven. I don't believe I was in the third heaven. Honestly, I don't know. I, I really don't know. All I saw was, uh, it, it was still darkness around. It was, you know, it, I knew it was Jesus. I didn't see his face and you know, he was just ext extremely bright. Just cut, just covered, just pure, pure light. So he says, um, such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell God knoweth how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. So you can make the argument that he had it happen two times or he just expounding on the first, the first time. But either way, you see that he was caught up, caught up. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both in the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught away Philip. So we are seeing that the scripture do, do teach what we call a catching away, a rapture. That the eunuch saw him no more, and when, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. So the spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, and took him from, um, from where he was at. If I'm not mistaken, he was in Jerusalem, and then brought him all the way to Azotus teleportation time travel boom there you go right there and she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron and her child was caught up unto god and to his throne there you go christ being caught up for the lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. So the catching away, what we call the rapture, I like to call it the catching away. It is biblical. I proved it. I mean, it's clear as day. If you don't see it, then it's not meant for you to see. Um, what I believe is going to, how it's going to happen um, is that for those who are watching and waiting for Jesus to return and get us, that, you know, it's going to be pleasant, of course. But I believe for those who are not watching and waiting, those who this event is not going to be for it's going to look like hell. It's going to look like a whole bunch of tornadoes and hurricanes everywhere. That's what it's going to look like to them. That's what I, that's how I believe it's going to happen. Cause I just, I said it because I know how the Lord works. Um, one thing could look one way to somebody else. And then another thing could look, um, like, like something to somebody else. Think about when, Christ was leading the Israelites um, out of Egypt. And to them, it was one thing, but to the, uh, the Egyptians that were chasing them, it was something completely different. It was darkness to them. So this event is something completely different than what we call the, the second coming. And we're going to address that later in this uh, video. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of this sight. 
So just as Christ was taken up, just as Christ was caught up, as we read in other scriptures, and also in this one again, um, we will be caught up. And we will be uh, uh, taken up in the clouds to meet the Lord. So, again, it's biblical. Anybody that says otherwise, they're lying. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Hmm. So what is the covenant? For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. Gather my saints together unto me. So who, who are these saints that are being gathered together unto him? The saints that have made a covenant with him. And what's the covenant? The taking away of the sins, the gospel, his shed blood, faith in his finished work. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant, the blood covenant, with me by sacrifice, by the sacrifice of himself. Trusting in his finished work. Trusting in his shed blood. Trusting in the gospel. Trusting in who he said he is. The Messiah. The righteous perisheth and no man layeth it to heart. And merciful men are taken away. None considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. He shall enter into peace. They shall rest in their beds, each one walking in his uprightness. Now, this could be uh, two different things that I see so far. You could be taken out um, by death. You could die and, you know, nobody, nobody really cares. The, uh, the wicked, they don't care. And also what we call the rapture, the catching away. Considering the righteous, righteous is taken away from the evil to come. Because we know the, um, the catching away is to take us away from the evil that is to come because that's not for us. It's not for us. Um, so also, I believe that when this event does happen, that the number is going to be small anyway. Very, very small. Like extremely small. That's why we must examine ourselves. And people aren't even going to realize that we're gone for the most part. They're not even going to realize that we're gone. Meaning that, think about this. If it's only a very, very, very small percentage, like let's say half a percent. <laughs> yeah, half a percent. If it's only half a percent, they can control that in regards to the stories. If let's just say I disappear. Of course, my parents will be looking for me. You know, the people that I work around, they will be looking for me. The people that I, I speak to one night in my neighborhood, they will be looking for me. Um, but even in that, I don't speak to a lot of people. So it wouldn't be a lot of people that would be looking for me. I can probably count on one hand how many people would be looking for me so it would be easier for uh them to control the narrative in regards to what happened to us because it's probably not going to make news and if it is you know all they're going to do is gloss over it with um you no know, with other news stories to distract people so as you know it's not hard to see that hey the 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 catching away can happen and they not even know that it's happened it's happened until it's too late because the number is going to be that that small so it's going to be easier for them to control the narrative of what actually happened of course there are going to be people out there that come to a realization of what happened but um you know nobody's going to be re re listening re excuse me Nobody's going to be really listening to them. So when you see the movies and everything, the the uh, rapture movies and this this mass amount of people, and you know what I'm saying everybody's running around crazy, 
It's not going to be like that. It's not going to be like that. In my father's house are many mansions. If I were, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. He's talking about preparing a place in heaven and uh, receiving us there. He ain't talk, he's not talking about the second coming, him physically coming here on earth. It doesn't make any sense. <sighs> that where I am, there ye may be also. And where thy go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas says unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus says unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God in a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Where? In the heavens. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. The new tabernacles that we're going to receive are the new bodies. In my father's house are many mansions. He goes to prepare a place for us. Not only the new bodies that we're going to receive, but the new heavens and the new earth. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no go and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. So boom, there you go. It comes out of heaven. He said he goes to prepare a place for us. And to receive us to him. Now, of course, if you if you don't if you if you die before that, absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. If you live up until um that point and you are watching and you are waiting, then guess what? You will be caught up. If not, then guess what? You're going through the time of Jacob's trouble. So that wouldn't apply to you. As far as um, um, him receiving you to him. Because you will be received to him if you were watching and waiting. And truly born again. If you're not watching and waiting, then you're not going to be received to him. You're going to go through the time of Jacob's trouble. So is there an escape for those who are waiting and watching? Because people say, oh, the rapture, it's a lie. You know what I'm saying? It's, you know, all type of stupid arguments. Like you're afraid of death. Or you're a coward. It's not the point of being afraid of death. It's about fearing the Lord. Who in the hell wants to go through the time of Jacob's trouble when you read what's going to be happening in the book of Revelation? That's just pure foolishness. That's just pure fool. Do you, do you, do you, want, to, do you want America to go to war right now? You want World War III to break out on America's soil right now? Even though you may not dis even though you may dislike America, do who wants war to break out on American soil? Nobody. We know it's gonna happen. But you know, it kind of makes it hard to preach the gospel if you're if you're running trying to hide from bullets and bombs being dropped. Like we gotta start using some spiritual common sense. <laughs> yeah. Would you rather live in wicked America? The way it is now, with some form of peace, with God protecting this country right now, or would you rather live in America with bombs being dropped? Like, come on. The answer is, the answer is easy. Any, anybody's going to choose choose the, the other one, you know, or the, the first one. So again, is there an escape for those who are waiting and watching? Yes, Jesus promised they escape. 
Watch ye therefore and pray always. Pray always for what, Jesus? Watch for what, Jesus? That ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. So Jesus himself said that there is a escape. So believing in what we call the pre-trib rapture, the pre-trib catching away uh, is not escapism. It's a promise from the Lord for watching and praying always. He told us to pray that we can escape, that we are counted worthy to escape. Because he know how bad it's going to be. Only a, fool, only a fool would say, yeah, I want to go through that time period. Be careful what you pray for. Which is a manifest token of the righteousness, excuse me, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. The time of Jacob's trouble is recompense to them that have been disobedient to those of us who preach the gospel because Christ has sent us the Father has sent us in the name of Jesus Christ. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus which delivered us from the wrath to come. So either God did not appoint us to wrath or he did appoint us to wrath. So since we're living in the last days, when does the wrath come? And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal and lo, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks, follow us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? Hmm. 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 For God hath not appointed us to wrath. Hmm. And hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand? Now you have this whole um, pre wrath, rapture, and all this other stuff. Um, this right here shows you that we at least rather you believe in, you know, you're at, you, you hold the, um, pre wrath stance or whatever stance you hold. This shows you so far that we at least have to be gone before the sixth seal, because this is when the wrath of the lamb comes upon the world. We at least have to be gone before the sixth seal. Simple. He said, we're not appointed to wrath. Six seals are broken. Here's the wrath. All I'm going to show you is that we are gone before all the seals are broken because we are up in heaven when Jesus is breaking the seals because the, the scroll, the book, that has the seven seals on it. It's like a title deed. It's like a deed. It's like a will. And it's our inheritance. 
Christ is, Christ is getting his inheritance, what's rightfully his, and we are there with him at the reading of the will, at the reading of the deed. So let's continue on so we can prove it. So we want to address this. Uh, before we do that, we want to address this first part right here. The burden of Babylon, which Isaiah, the son of Amos, did see. Lift ye up a banner upon the high mountain. Exalt the voice unto them. Shake the hand that they may go into the gates of the nobles. I've commanded my sanctified ones. I have also called my mighty ones for my anger, even them that rejoice in my highness, the noise of a multitude in the mountains, like as of a great people, a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations gathered, gathered together. The Lord of hosts mustereth the hosts of the battle. They come from a far country, from the end of heaven, where from the end of heaven, even the Lord and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land. How ye for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint and every man's heart shall melt and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrow shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. If you read your scripture, then these scriptures should sound familiar. Um, in Matthew 24, Luke, um, and also Mark and John too. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger to lay the land desolate and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it for the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light the sun shall be darkened what in his going forth so this is jesus coming forth so the sun is darkened because his glory is greater than the glory of the sun he outshines he's so bright that the sun becomes dark and the moon shall not cause her light to shine because the moon reflects the light of the sun so that shows you right there that ties in directly with the sixth seal and what he's gonna what is he gonna do what he's coming to do and i will punish the world for their evil are you evil so why would this time period be for you and the wicked for the inequity. Are you wicked? So why would this time period be for you? And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease. And I will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I will make a man more precious than fine gold. Even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. So it's going to be a terrible time where people are going to be slaughtered. But it's not for us. This is, it's a day. The day of the Lord cometh cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger. He said that we are not appointed to wrath. So we at least have to be gone before the sixth seal is broken. What would be the purpose of us, him coming to get us, take us in the clouds if he's, if he's, if he's coming back right then and we, we're going to be here on earth. That doesn't make any sense. Therefore, I will shake the heavens and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. And it shall be as the chase roe and as a sheep that no man taketh up. They shall every man turn to his own people. So the sheep, people are going to be like sheep and just sitting there crying, scared, shaking. And nobody going to come get them, help them. They shall every man turn to his own people and flee everyone into his own land. Everyone that is found. Because remember, they're going to hide in the rocks. So if they out in the open, guess what? They're going to get it. Shall be thrust through. And everyone that is joined unto them shall fall by the sword. Their children also shall be dashed. Their children also shall be struck violently to pieces before their eyes. 
Oh, I don't. That's not my God. My my Jesus is a loving God, loving Jesus. That's the Jesus I serve. He's the God of love. He is a God of love. But this is the same Jesus that you claim that you that you worship and serve. That's saying this. So what you what you got to say now? I give you the full counsel of God, all the counsel, the whole counsel of God. These are scriptures you ain't gonna hear a lot. You ain't gonna hear this from the the happy-go-lucky people. They're gonna tell you. They're gonna talk about children being dashed to pieces, children being struck violently to pieces before their parents' eyes. They can be like, "That's not. That's not the God that I serve." You very well may be right. It may not be the God that you serve, but this is the God that I serve. This is why I fear. I respect him because he will do this. If he sees fit and if he does it and he's going to do it, it's in the 100% righteousness. The houses shall be spoiled or stripped, pillaged and plundered of their goods openly by force and their wives shall be ravished. Their wives shall be seized and carried away by violence and brutally raped. Hmm. But, but you want to be a part of this though, huh? Okay. Behold, I will stir up the Medes, which are today the modern day Iranians against them, against uh, Babylon, which the final Babylon, Mr. Babylon is going to be located over there in what we call the, what we call the Middle East. Right now it's America. But the final one will be located in the so-called Middle East. So the Medes, the modern day Iranians, uh, they will not regard silver, not gonna be able to pay them off. And as for gold, they shall not delight in it. Their bows also shall dash, shall strike violently the young men to pieces. And they shall have no pity on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes shall not spare children. So they're even gonna kill the, the children that are still in the parents' womb in the mother's womb in babylon the glory of kingdoms the beauty of the chaldees excellency shall be as when god overthrew sodom and gomorrah and we covered those scriptures before as, as far as how god is going to literally um have hell right there when people are coming up to jerusalem to excuse me to jerusalem they're literally going to see hell again for God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. So, does Jesus come multiple times? Let's see. Because people say, oh, the, the first coming, the second advent, and the second excuse me the first advent and the second advent not realizing that in each what we call advent jesus came multiple times in the same way before he came as who we call jesus christ today he was on this earth he he came to um abraham he came to isaac came to jacob came to all of them he visited all of them he came to moses uh, he came to the he came to the disciples, um, Melchizedek, he was known as Melchizedek. That was Jesus. That was Jesus. He just wasn't called Jesus yet because Jesus Christ has a specific meaning for a specific purpose. But when it talks about Melchizedek and that's a sermon in itself, you can go study. That was literally who we know today as Jesus Christ. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping and as she wept she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher and see if two angels in white sitting the one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of jesus had lain and they say unto her woman why weepest thou she saith unto them because they have taken away my lord and i know not where they have laid him and when she had thus said she turned herself back and saw jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. I wonder if one of these angels that were sitting there was Jesus and she didn't even know it. Jesus 
Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. So she thought he was the gardener. Now, let me show you the wisdom that God gave me with this. Ask yourself this. Why would she think that he was the gardener? Why would she think that he was the gardener? <laughs> what, is, what is a gardener known for? Planting stuff. A gardener, you can say, uh, they, play in, they play in dirt. He looked like the gardener. She thought he was a gardener because of his because of his appearance. So obviously he had dirt and stuff on him. He looked dirty. <laughs> Why would he look dirty? Hmm. Where did he just come from? Um. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him. Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. Remember where Jesus had went. He went to the He went into the heart of the earth. Yet when he's he's here, when he was resurrected, he hadn't ascended to heaven yet. That's why she mistook him for she thought he was a gardener. He was dirty. He had literal dirt on him. His flesh, you know what I'm saying? It probably looked looked a certain way. It wasn't it wasn't too bad because the the um the scriptures say that his flesh did not see corruption. But she mistook mistook him for the gardener. You do we think that he was walking around with garden tools in his hand? No. So why was she mistaken for the gardener? But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. So here's Jesus walking around here on earth, hadn't even ascended up to heaven yet. And guess what? He ascends up, then he comes back down. <laughs> he, he ascends up and he comes back down. You're going to see that. You're not going to hear too many people be fair with the scriptures and tell you stuff like this. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. Keep in mind where he was at. He stood in the mist. Stood in the mist. Stood in the mist. Keep that in mind because it's going to play a major part um, in a little bit. And when he had said so, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when you read the rest of them, um, you, you, you read about Thomas and Thomas, you know, I, I'm going to go in detail about Thomas, but Thomas ends up sticking his hand, his hand in the Lord's hand where his wounds were in, in his side. But yet he told, um, Mary to don't touch him yet because he hadn't, he hadn't ascended yet. Christ keeps his wounds. He keeps his wounds because when he comes back, the scriptures say that they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came into the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher and they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. 
And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he, he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. And returned from the sepulchre and told all these things unto the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and other women that were with them, which told these things unto the apostles. And their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. See, that's why the Lord, you know, he, he, the Lord reveals a lot of things to women first. <laughs> You know, because men, you know, we, 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 be, we be stubborn sometimes, a lot of times. Then arose Peter and ran unto the sepulcher, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves and departed, wandering in himself at that which was to come, which was come to pass, wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. So Peter, you know, Peter was like, I'm going to go check it out myself. He ran, he ran to it and, and seen what was up. We know how Peter got down. And behold, two of them went that same day to the village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they were, while they communed together and the reason Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were holding that they should not know him. So here Jesus, he didn't crept up on them. They didn't even know. And he said unto them, what manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? And the one of them, and the one of them whose name was Cleophas, answering said unto him art thou only a stranger in jerusalem and hast not known the things which are which are come to pass there in these days and he said unto them what things and they said unto him concerning jesus of nazareth which was a prophet mighty indeed in word before god and all the people and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him but we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they, and when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels. See, a vision, they, they said they, they came and seen a vision of angels, but they literally saw the angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the women had said, but him they saw not. So even Jesus, here goes Jesus, Jesus was still testing them. He was still testing their faith. He could have easily just came out and told them or whatnot. <laughs> It's all a test, y'all. It's a test. Then he said unto them, O fools! Oh, G Jesus wouldn't say nothing like that. Jesus wouldn't say anything like that to, to people today. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. So here Jesus is resurrected, resurrected from the dead, walking around his walking around with his people. And he caused he caused them fools and slow of heart to believe, because they didn't they still didn't believe after it had happened. <laughs> he right there next to them, testing them. He lied, really. Y'all did y'all didn't believe a word that I said, did you? The woman just came back and told you that my body ain't there, and y'all know the tomb was covered up, the rock was rolled in front of it, it was sealed, and it was guards there. And you know what I'm saying? And my body, my, how my body get out of there? Oh my God. Like, Father, do you, do you see this? <laughs> then Jesus goes on to say, Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them 
and all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So he's telling them, he's still telling them. And they drew nigh unto the village whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. So he's telling them all this, and they still don't get it. <laughs> they still don't know it's him. But they constrain him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And they came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and break and gave to them. So he brought something back into the remembrance. <laughs> then it's like they got it. And their eyes were open and they knew him. And he what? He vanished out of their sight. Mm -mm -mm. Boom, he's just gone. <laughs> he he did what he needed to do. Make he he made his point. And they said one to another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? So they're rehashing it. They're replaying what had just happened and saying, was that? No, that couldn't have been him. Yes, it was him. Like, you know, our heart was burning. Like, you know, because when you listen to the word of God, when God is speaking to you, your heart burns. That fire just, just blazes. You know, that, that love just oh, is overwhelming. So he did the, the, the Lord's Supper with them and they remembered. And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them saying, The Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen his spirit. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see. So, he came back down after he went up um, and sprinkled the blood in the mercy seat. Because remember he told, told old girl to touch me not. Don't touch me yet because I have not ascended up yet. So he ascended up, sprinkled the blood on the mercy seat, and then he came back down and did these different things. Behold my hands and my feet that it is I myself handle me and see. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me have. So he had his new glorified body. Notice he had flesh and bones. Didn't say anything about flesh and blood. He has no need for blood anymore, because the blood has been shed. <laughs> and when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. He showed them his wounds. So even, his, even in his glorified body, he kept his wounds. There's many reasons for that. And while they yet believed not for joy and wonder, he said unto them. So they were like, uh, they still weren't sure. Have ye here any meat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and of an honeycomb. And he took it and did eat before them. So in our new glorified bodies, do we get to eat? Yes. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all these, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me, Jesus. So, behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished. Remember we read that earlier. And half of the city shall go forth into captivity. Remember I did a sermon about the final captivity. The final captivity is during the time of Jacob's trouble. Half of the city, Jerusalem, when the, the real Jews are back over there, um, they shall go forth into captivity 
and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the from the city. So the the remnant they're going to escape. Half of the half of them are going to go into captivity, and then the remnant they're going to escape. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. So notice what it says in the part that I have highlighted. And um, well, the first part we want to address is this. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, right? Then we jump down and what does it say? And half of the city shall go forth into captivity, right? So after half of the city goes into captivity, captivity during this time period what then shall the lord go forth i thought y'all said that america this american captivity was the final captivity it's not it's one more and his feet shall stand in that day upon the mount of olives so this is a completely different event from being caught up in the clouds completely different event from being caught up in the clouds and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives which is before Jerusalem on the east and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west and there shall be a very great valley and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south and ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains. That was that remnant, the residue that he was talking about. The ones that, that listened, they're going to get up out of there. For the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azal. Yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come and all the saints with thee. So let's get some correlating scriptures. And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea, what? Flee to the mountains. So he's giving them a warning before that. He says, when you shall see Jerusalem compass with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. So it's about to happen. So guess what? Get on out of there. Get to the, mount get to the mountains. And let them which are in the midst of it depart out. And let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land. And what? And wrath upon this people. Upon what people? Wrath goes upon the Jew first. And then the Gentile. So everybody, all these Hebrew Israelites are talking about. Judgment is coming upon the white man this and the white man that. Guess what? Judgment comes upon Israel first. And Israel gets it worse. So, <laughs> what, you, what, what, are you, what are they talking about? They ain't talking about nothing. And wrath upon this people. He's talking about his own people, first and foremost. And then the, uh, the Gentiles. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall what? And shall be led away captive into all nations. So when the... Uh, the physical Jews are um, in the land because they go over there by themselves. It's not the Lord doing it. They have this false exodus. I believe this is how it's going to go down. It's going to be a false exodus. When the Antichrist steps on the scene and they're going to think that's Jesus. Um, ultimately, when the abomination of desolation is about to happen, Boom, the wrath is going to end up coming upon the people. They're going to fall by the edge of the sword and they're going to be led away and led away captive into all nations. So again, there's another captivity coming. There's another captivity coming. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Well, let's think about this. This is going to be during this time period. 
we know that the Gentiles are already over there, um, over there troddening down the, the land. So, you know, if you think about all the way that we've been taught, prophecy doesn't fit with what this is saying. The way we've been taught, it doesn't fit. So the people that we know are the physical Israelites, they have to be in the land for them to end up um, fleeing into the mountains for wrath to come upon the people so they, for them to fall by the edge of this war and for them to be led away captive into all nations at the final time. They have to be over there for it to happen. That's why he said, then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. How can they, why does it matter if they're in Judea? They have to be there. They're not there right now. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. People try to apply that to today. It applies, but it more so applies to this prophetic time here. When ye therefore shall see the, the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. How can they flee into the mountains if they're, if they're not in Judea? The Jews, the physical Jews overall are not in the land. So something has to happen for them to be in the land and thinking that, hey, this is it. I wonder if it has anything to do with this false Messiah and this false peace, which I see all these uh, uh, Israelite, Hebrew Israelite pastors speaking about Christ coming and this, you know, in this great time that's going to that's come. Now it is correct, but they aren't telling you it's like they're skipping over the time of Jacob's trouble. So if they're skipping over the time of Jacob's trouble and they're excited about, um, about the, the kingdom being established and everything, then most likely when the Antichrist steps on the scene and presents himself as, as Jesus and claims to be a Jew claims, you know what I'm saying? All these different things then most likely they're going to buy into it thinking that's Jesus and think, oh, this is the exodus. We're going back to the land. So in Revelation 10, we see another, what we call a coming of Jesus. That's completely different from the catching away in the clouds. And it's also completely different from um, when he steps foot on the Mount of Olives. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was upon his head and his face was as it were the sun and his feet as pillars of fire. Easy to see this is talking about Jesus. And he had in his hand a little book open. This is the same book that's, that he had um, earlier in the book of Revelation that had the seven seals on it. It's the same book. And he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth. Different event. And he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered and write them not. And the angel, which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever. Showing you again, this, this is Jesus because he's swearing. The Bible tells us not to swear by swear on God or swear by God, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things that, and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer so he's bearing witness to on the earth and the sea he multiple pretty much multiple witnesses no time time no longer you know saying it's a wrap no more grace y'all had your chance so now we want to get into the seven golden candlesticks mystery because remember it's, it's given to us to know the mysteries 
the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to what? To show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. So we're supposed to know these things. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. John to the seven churches, seven which are in Asia, grace be unto you in peace from him which is and which was and which is to come. And from the seven, you see I'm putting emphasis on certain words for a reason, seven spirits which are before his throne, seven churches, seven spirits before the throne. So he's going to tell us um, in a minute what the mystery is. And I turn to see the voice that spake with me. Remember we read about that voice earlier. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst, remember, I told you to remember that. In the midst, what? Of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girth about the pops, paps, with a golden girdle. Remember, he appeared to them. He was he appeared in the midst of them. Here's Jesus in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. So what are these what are these seven golden candlesticks? Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. So he's gonna tell what the he's gonna tell what they are. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks, the seven golden candlesticks, which thou sawest are the seven churches. Also the seven church ages. When you, when you, when you get deeper into it. So he tells us the mystery. It was a mystery. Why is anybody, why is nobody really talking about this mystery? We're supposed to know these things. Let's prove it. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. He just said that the the um, the seven golden candlesticks was a mystery, and that he gave the revelation of the mystery. But even if he gives the revelation of the mystery, you still have to have the understanding given by the spirit. So this is why I can, I can um, give you the mystery of the seven golden candlesticks and correlate it with what we call the rapture because it's given unto not only me, but others who are preaching this to know. It's given to you to know. So you need to take this and study yourself. And if you're a preacher, or a teacher, you know, study this and then go give it to your people. Because this is a great mystery in these last days. And he said, unto you is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. But to others in parables, that seeing they might not see and hearing, they might not understand. So there's only a small group of people that's going to understand even this sermon. I thought I'd break it down point by point. Because it's not given to them to understand it. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards, stewards of the mysteries of God. So we're supposed to know these things. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall 
all be changed. You know why people argue about there's a rapture, there's no rapture, or when it when it happens. You know why they're confused because they they don't understand what they're, they're saying themselves. God gives clarity. God gives clarity. They they're piggybacking off of what somebody else said and don't even know really what they're preaching about. God said that we are supposed to understand the mysteries, even the mystery which have been hid from ages and from generations. But now what is made manifest to his saints? Hmm. Interesting. Speaks for itself. So let's get some correlating scriptures. And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold. A beaten work shall the candlestick be made. His shaft and his branches, his bowls, his knops, and his flowers shall be of the same. And six branches shall come out of the sides of it. Three branches of the candlestick out of the one side and three branches of the candlestick out of the other side. Hmm. Candlesticks in the Old Testament. Doesn't the scripture say something about that? They were a pattern. They were a shadow of the real thing. The pure candlestick with the lamps thereof, even with the lamps to be set in order and all the vessels thereof and the oil for light. Hmm. He said the seven golden candlesticks represent the seven churches. And here you have the candlesticks, the pure candlesticks with the lamps on top of the candlestick, right? And then you have the oil for the light to light the, the candlesticks and light the, light the lamps. I wonder what that oil is that's continually burning before the Lord, as you see in Leviticus 24, verse 4. He shall order the lamps upon the pure candlestick before the Lord continually. The candlesticks burn before the Lord continually. They did not go out. That's why that uh, third temple altar dedication, it was a mockery. Speak unto Aaron and say unto him, when thou lightest the lamps, the seven lamps shall give light over against the candlestick. And this work of the candlestick was of beaten gold unto the shaft thereof, unto the flowers thereof, was beaten work according to, unto the pattern which the Lord had showed Moses. So he made the candlestick. So the Lord showed Moses the pattern of how he was supposed to make the candlesticks and make everything else. They were foreshadowing something else. I wonder what, hint, 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 seven candlesticks which represent the seven churches. Look what he says, let's tie it together. Ye are the light of the world a city is set a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid new jerusalem us we make up new jerusalem that's why he said he will make you a pillar in his city in his temple neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel but what but on a candlestick so if we are the light of the world, then we are on the candlestick. Oh, that makes sense. He said the seven churches, are, the seven golden candlesticks are the seven churches. And they give us light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father, which is in heaven. What's the light that's in us that burns continually before the Lord? The Holy Spirit. The ladder, we go up and down the ladder. We are connected in the same way. The pure uh, golden candlesticks, they had the lamps on it. They had the, uh, the pipe going to it and the oil flow through the pipe going to the, um, the lamp for it to burn continuously. We are, we are connected to the Lord because we are one with him and the oil is continuously flowing and the light that is in us, the light of Christ, it continuously burns. And Christ is in the midst.
After this I looked, and behold, a door was open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald and round about the throne round about it were four and twenty seats and upon the seats i saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed with white raiment the same raiment that christ had on when um peter and the other disciples they went up and moses and them were up there they were dressed in white raiment and they had on their heads crowns of gold. They have on crowns of gold because they have went to the judgment seat of, of Christ and received their rewards. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were what? Seven lamps of fire. Seven. Seven lamps. Seven churches. Seven golden candlesticks lamps sit on top of the candlestick so here you are the church is in heaven even before the seals are broken and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne which are the seven spirits of god you see how it all ties together you don't have lamps without the candlestick the lamps sit on top of the candlestick and burn before the throne, before, burn before the Lord. In the same way, guess what? We're here on earth, candlesticks, with the lamp sitting on top of it. The Holy Spirit indwelling us, burning before the Lord who is sitting on his throne in heaven. So do you get it? And there were seven lamps. The lamps sit on top of the candlesticks, seven golden candlesticks, which were, which it says the seven golden candlesticks are the seven churches. A fire burning before the throne, burning before Jesus, which are the seven spirits of God. Seven spirits. Remember it said the seven angels of each church. Again, the church is in heaven right here. So let's bring in some more witnesses and tie this all together to prove it that much more. And the angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that is waking out of his sleep and said unto me, what seest thou? And I said, I have looked and behold a candlestick of all gold with a bowl upon the top of it and his seven lamps thereon and seven pipes to the seven lamps which are upon the top thereof and two olive trees by it one upon the right side of the bowl and the other upon the left side thereof so i answered and spake to the angel that talked with me saying what are these my lord so he's saying what 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 are these what are these candlesticks what are these seven lamps they have that are sitting on top of the candlesticks and what are these uh, two olive trees by it? Then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. For who have despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord. Hmm, those seven. 
He's speaking prophetically, not only talking about that time period, but prophetically in the future, future event in regards to like right now, which run to and fro through the whole earth. Then answer I and said unto him, what are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? So he told him what the uh, seven golden candlesticks were. And you see how, how it ties together. Now watch this. And I answered again, showing you that the seven golden candlesticks is the church. And the church is in in heaven. Um, come up hither. And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he said, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Hmm. So the candlesticks, they represented something. The two olive trees that represented something. And it tells us that the two olive trees, they are the two anointed ones. So literal people that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. So who are these? There are two witnesses in the book of Revelation. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar. And them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not for it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city shall they tread under foot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the god of the earth read that one more time these are the two olive trees remember we did a sermon in regards to the trees in the garden of eden what they really had to do with give this is another example of that these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks two candlesticks standing before the god of the earth so there you have it the seven golden candlesticks are the seven churches and they are in heaven before the lord with the lord being in the midst before his wrath is poured out as we saw because we are not appointed to wrath before the seals are broken because we are there when the when the um when the when the when the seals are when the seals are broken, we are there when they are broken. Because we saw that what? Again, the seven golden candlesticks are the seven churches. And then you have the seven lamps that sit on top of the seven golden candlesticks. They were in Revelation 4, burning before the Lord continuously right before he's about to break the seals. So the, the catching away, what we call a pre-trib, is for a specific group of people. Now again, there are what we call multiple uh, raptures, multiple catching aways during that time period. There are multiple ones, but the one that we are focused on is what we call pre-trib. And I pretty much, you know, prove that from this sermon and many other sermons that I've done on this topic. But if you can't see it, then, you know, pray about it, or maybe it's just not meant, to, meant for you to know the mysteries of God. I mean, that's what the scriptures say. It's pretty plain and pr uh, pretty clear to me. But with that being said, God bless each and every one of you in Jesus Christ's name. As always, stay focused for Jesus. And as you know, truth is not debated. It is declared. Either way, be ready. Either way. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. If it was edifying to you, be sure to do your part and share it on all 
your social media outlets, websites, and forums. Your help is greatly appreciated to help fight this war and reach lost souls. Don't forget to like, dislike, and or subscribe. Be sure to also check out our website, Staying Focused for Jesus dot life and make sure you check out that resource section which has a lot of videos that i share and some other stuff books um, documents pdf websites many many things and it's growing daily as i add to it also follow us on facebook for even more content staying focused for jesus on facebook Because you say I am rich and increased with goods and in need of nothing And no, oh no, you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked So then because you are lukewarm and neither could know Jesus said that he would spit you out of his mouth. Stop playing church. We become something else, something worse, something more like the world. Where is the church? We become something else, neither hot nor cold. Jesus said, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that you may be rich, clothed in white raiment to hide the shame of your nakedness. So then because you Jesus said that he would spit you out of his mouth. Stop playing church. We become something else, something worse, something more like the world. Where is the church? We become something else, neither hot nor cold. You say you a Christian, living yeah. like a child to hell. You a Christian, go to church, say the sinner's prayer. You a Christian, stay getting high, getting throwed. Yeah, Monday through Saturday, anything go. Yeah, caught up in the world and left your first love. Jesus died in your place, he shed his precious blood. But you gotta be seen, pastor, apostle. Wake up, church, time to go and preach the gospel.